Okay, uh, good evening, afternoon, wherever you are. So uh, I think it's it's my third or fourth time I'm presenting at this event. So I feel like at home. So uh, and we'll spend I think an hour uh, talking about databases, but not uh, from like developer perspective uh, and modeling perspective, but we'll go a little bit deeper uh, because uh, I'm really curious uh, how things work. Uh, and this led me to this uh, research I did years ago uh, and trying to understand what actually happens when I write to database or when I read from database. And uh, this research five years ago led me to uh, become an employee of the database company. So first I was like super curious how things work. Uh, and few days later, I joined Neo4j uh, uh, and started working on, on database. So uh, this is how you get interesting job. <laughs> uh, so a little bit about me, I'm Jarek. Uh, I live uh, in Krakow, Poland, uh, and I'm working remotely for Neo4j, uh, which is a Swedish uh, slash US company. We have headquarters in, in US, but uh, yeah, it all started in Sweden. Uh, and uh, I work there as senior staff engineer in the benchmarking, uh, benchmarking team. So I my last five years is benchmarking databases. Uh, so you must imagine how happy I am. Uh, but before Neo4j, uh, I worked for different companies, mostly Java. I would say 98% of my career, uh, technical part of my career was connected with Java. I had some like uh, interesting uh, period of being architect and manager, but I came back to you know technical stuff because uh, this is uh, this is the thing I am and enjoy, and I mostly uh, work in Java, uh, JVM in general. So I care less about language. Uh, it's mostly things uh, uh, running on JVM. Okay, so when I was uh, I came up uh, to mm, to this idea of a stock like at one of the conferences. Uh, talking in the corridors with people that uh, I realized that people don't know how databases work. Uh, and uh, there's a problem that it's really hard to find like a good starting point uh, because the um, the topic is really broad and, and really deep. It's over 40, I would say even 50 years of uh, research and development. Uh, databases are pretty old concept. Uh, so it's really hard to find a single place where, where to start. So I thought uh, after this discussion at the conference, one of the conferences in Poland, I'd say, okay, I will do like 50 minutes, maximum hour uh, presentation to, to help you get started with databases uh, and uh, trying to understand what actually happens when you run a query on a database. And because the concept of the databases is so big and and old and with a lot of different fields of research and a lot of different uh, approaches and types of databases, uh, I try to keep it simple. Uh, uh, and I probably ignored, probably, I'm sure I ignored some of the concepts. Uh, so when you start learning about it, uh, deeper you will see that I skipped some uh, some ideas just to make sure that we will squeeze uh, in, within an hour and some of the things I just barely touch uh, I rather talk what it does and why it's important uh, in a database uh, and I in some cases focus less how it's implemented uh, but I focus on on its responsibility as a component of the database system. At the end, there will be a last slide with references and books where where you can dig deeper if you if you want. And I'm okay with asking questions. I have a second uh, monitor, so I can see your questions on a second monitor. So uh, it's okay uh, if you write in the chat, and I will try to respond. Uh, 
Okay, let's go. One thing, warning. Uh, so I have like almost 25 years of uh, career in IT. And over this 25 years, I have like developed strong affection to programming languages and databases, and I can talk hours about it. Uh, so be warned, uh, I can get too excited and emotional because some topics for me are especially interesting. Uh, so I, I want to say sorry before, yeah, <laughs> before the presentation. Okay, let's start. Uh, let's start and let's have like brief a uh, short discussion. I don't want to bore you with like theory and historical uh, and history, but I think it's good to set a context. So basically what we know, what is the database? The database is a collection of data. Yeah. And then we have something that allows us to manage this data, ac access this data and modify it. And it is called a database management system. So the truth is, this talk is not about databases, but this talk is about the database management system. Because databases is the collect database is a collection of data. DBMS is something that manages this data. So uh, we are going to focus on DBMSs. Okay. Uh, so when it all started, I think uh, when I think about it, database started in the moment people in like caves managed to capture the knowledge and information in form of pictures of, of of writing. So I think the database are with humanity from day almost zero. The moment when, or maybe with not humanity, but with the civilization. The, the moment when civilization started, I think this is the moment where the databases were created. Of course, they first were analog databases, no computers, everything was written on paper, in stone. Uh, but I think uh, if you really think about it, it's really, really old con uh, concept. And I think the first world global database was a uh, library in Alexandria. This is like a picture. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, the first database administrators are people managing uh, books uh, and manuscripts in, in, in libraries. And some of the concepts, even like indexes and directories were created years, centuries ago. And we still use the, the concept of index and directory was developed when the first libraries were created. So uh, the, data, the database systems uh, came pretty early in the history of computer uh, computers and how it all started and how it all looks. So I think um, historically it's seventies where we realized that you know the computers be computers became cheaper, the prices of the hardware dropped, they became more affordable outside of academia. So private organizations started to use uh, computers, and this is where we can say okay, uh, because we have computers, we have disks, we have persistent storage, we start to digitize our knowledge. Uh, and, and this is where we can say the 70s, this is the, the moment the databases were born. And actually there are two models and it's important. Uh, one was uh, the network model called uh, Codacil and then we had a hierarchical model. I was lucky enough to work with hierarchical database. Uh, this was my first like project 25 years ago when some company didn't use the relational database, they use a hierarchical database. And I also work at Sabre and Sabre is really often cited as a first commercial successful uh, database system. And it's still living today. If you like book tickets or hotels, you probably uh, go through the Sabre system. And it was developed by IBM and, and uh, American Airlines. Then come the 70s. And this is the moment when uh, Edward Cott publishes the paper about relational algebra and relational databases. And this is the moment when we disconnect the data representation in storage from the data, um, from the logical structure of the data. Okay, because in the past, the hierarchical databases or network databases, it was one-to-one -one mapping between the hardware and, and the software. Okay, the, the storage and the model was exactly what was stored on disks. 
And this is the first attempt to say, okay, we have some model, we will model tables and uh, you know, we use tables, we use the relations, uh, but the physical storage will be different and the database will do the mapping between how we see world and how we store the data, okay? So this is 70s. 80s uh, is super interesting um, because in the 80s, this is the moment when the SQL, the SQL was born like uh, late 70s, but uh, in the 80s well, it was standardized. And uh, so, you know, the race of SQL, and it's still, I think, the king. Uh, if uh, in the mm, in, in programming languages for databases work. So uh, it's hard to uh, find more widely used language uh, to work with databases. So 80s is the uh, is the time for, for SQL and domination of SQL. And then we go quickly uh, to 90s where we have internet. And this is where the databases, I think, exploded because what internet cost is we no longer were dealing with databases with hundreds of users or thousands of uh, thousands of users we were dealing with databases with you know hundreds thousands of users sometimes millions and you know the data sets uh, are became bigger the model became more complex and 90s are the explosion of sql databases in, in databases in general uh, and of course uh, you know with the internet, there is this uh, moment when we start to apply the client server model more widely. Uh, so we had like thin client disconnected from the server that was running the software. So it pushed even more pressure on the databases to become efficient uh, with dealing with the amount of data and amount of uh, con concurrent clients. And what is interesting from 90s is, you know, the Oracle and commercial databases like System R, uh, DB2, Microsoft SQL had found a competition like MySQL, PostgreSQL, and open source databases uh, because, you know, not all people could afford buying Oracle. And uh, the MySQL and PostgreSQL were like, were really could become, started to become alternatives used by you know internet companies uh, a lot and then we have 2000s when i think what's in my mind is like we are closing the cycle because no sql was not invented but reinvented because if you look at the 60s the first databases were not relational and they were not using sql uh, and you know after all this 40 years of development we realized okay from some use cases the SQL, the relational model, is not the best one. Uh, we want more scale. We know we want more data. We want to relax some of the databases' guarantees and say, okay, we don't need, for example, consistency. We can give a consistency for speed uh, and other things. So I think we came full cycle uh, into the 2000s. So enough about history, I think, because I assume all you wait is like you know the technical low level stuff. Uh, it's really some question from Roberto. Some years ago, we started investigating storing information in DNA and quantum storage. How close are we now of having databases based on these technologies? Uh, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> quantum, uh, uh, I think with quantum, uh, we are pretty close in my opinion, but it's not like everyone will be able to afford it so you know it's like quantum computing is so expensive and so complex to set up that uh it's like it will be like mainframes in in 70s 60s where you know some company will own uh quantum storage and it will just you know uh, share the quantum storage with somebody else but uh, i believe it's not the moment you know uh too expensive uh and we are far away from like general use case. What I think is we we will see a lot of development in this area, but what you see, it's like dominant. If you look at the databases history, it's like there are some ideas in academia and they become possible like 20 years later 
Like I work with the craft databases. Nobody thought craft databases would be like production ready and even possible. And now they are quite common, uh, especially with the rise of uh, 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 artificial intelligence. So probably you will see soon things run by academia or specialized uh, uh, companies, but to become like general purpose, I think we are years to come from it. Uh, okay. So what is the reason the database system exists? It's like, you know, I'm old and I am in the moment of my life when I asking this like fundamental questions, I care uh, less about, you know, <laughs> new advancements because I think uh, it's important to understand how things work and then you can build on the top of it. So I have this philosophical discussions with my friends, old friends, why database exists. And I think first, like really obvious thing is 640 kilobytes is not enough. You know, somebody said uh, years ago that, you know, we won't, we won't need beyond 640 Ks uh, uh, in computer. And this is the thing that, you know, if you, realized the first computers had even less RAM. It was like, you know, 32 or, you know, 250. And you had growing databases, growing set of data, and RAM was really expensive. And it's still expensive if you, if you compare it, I will show you. So the, what the type of problems database is solving is, okay, we have more data than we can fit into RAM, or we have even more data that we can fit on a single machine, but we still need to access this data in an efficient manner. So this is the kind of problems database uh, solve. RAM is expensive. Uh, you can laugh, but uh, if you take this and see the price, this is the numbers from before COVID. So it's 2022, I think, 2021. Uh, so if you look at the cost of one gigabyte RAM for DDR, SSD storage, and hard disk, you can see that main memory, the volatile memory, is much more expensive com compared to a non-volatile storage, so SSDs and hard disk. So still, this is true. The RAM is more expensive than uh, persistent storage. That's the one thing why I need databases. Another thing is, you know, we have our data and we want to make sense out of this data, make some business decisions. So what do we need? We need consistency. So we need to be sure that the data we have is consistent. We need durability. We don't want our database data to disappear. You know, the, the famous case of MongoDB losing rights uh, in the clusters. Uh, we want to have atomic uh, operations on databases. So when we change multiple entities, multiple objects, uh, we want to see it as a one uh, as a one change, and so on, so on. So this is the reason. Uh, but you no, know, without it, it would be really hard to write our applications if we wouldn't have a database because they guarantee a lot of uh, a lot of these things come for free uh, because we use database. Uh, there's a guy called, uh, his name is Pat Helland. He used to work in AWS. He wrote two interesting papers. And in one of his papers, he, um, he wrote this sentence. I really love it. Is that database is basically cache over event log. Look, you will see it, uh, when we start to dig deeper into, uh, the databases and the architecture, but yeah, it's actually our cache on the event log. You know, the event log is all the deletes, updates, chain, uh, inserts you do, uh, and database is basically cache. And there is also, I had this discussion on LinkedIn, uh, I think a year ago, but I came up, uh, yes, it's my ego, I'm sorry. But I, I think I'm right, but for me, databases is also like anti-corruption layer for data access patterns. Because when you write SQL queries, any type of queries, we don't think how the data will be fetched uh, from disk, how we will get these things from storage. This knowledge is in the database and we can design even broken schema, like not wrong schema, and database still will uh, give us this data, okay? Because it knows 
how to access the data and we don't need to think about okay pointer chasing and finding the right block to load and so on so uh for me it's the, like it's anti-corruption layer because we don't think how the data is layout on storage and even how it's layout in the cluster we don't know yeah real-time feeds cleaning data through this noise is critical that's true that's true so this is like introduction and now let's go to like the i was setting the context and now it's uh, time for the uh the meat of the presentation database management system for really extremely busy developers because i imagine you are super busy uh just like everyone else so to make this discussion simpler and to make sure that we can squeeze it within an hour, I don't talk about distributed databases, okay? Because this is whole another world of concept and ideas, and I solely focus on single database server node. Okay, we have single node, no distribution, no clustering, no replication, nothing. It's a single MySQL server or any server. Because what is interesting uh, it doesn't matter if you have document storage, graph database, uh, white column storage, uh, you know, relational database, key value stores, blah, blah, blah. Uh, because at the end, the pipeline, how your queries uh, are processed and how your data is stored is the same. So whatever I tell you here is in most cases true for all types of databases, excluding the in memory only databases because what I focus here now is databases with persistent storage. There's the whole world of in memory only databases. I skip it. And what I do is something that will kind of surprise you. I will go from the bottom of the stack to the top of the stack. So not from the top. And the top means, you know, receiving query and processing the query. I will go, will go in this presentation from the bottom because I think it's easier to understand why some decisions were made, were made and why some things work like this. Okay. So at the bottom of every um, database is storage. <laughs> DNA is a database. Uh, yeah, I think so. <laughs> uh replication machinery i think it's a way of distributed systems uh yeah <laughs> uh thank you uh so storage something that is you know storing your data persistently on disk how it works so the problem what we we are trying to solve is on one side we have our data model tables graphs documents white columns whatever you want, object uh, object databases, which were current, kind of popular at the end of 90s, but nothing serious happened in this area. Uh, so as you can see, tables, graphs, documents, they are structured data. They have hierarchy, they, are, they have structure. And the problem is that at the end of the day, we want to uh, store this n-dimensional data, because we don't know how many dimensions our uh, data models have, into like flat file, one dimensional flat file. And this is one interesting challenge. How to, for example, the graphs are a good example. How to store graph that has edges and nodes uh, and edges have direction and you have property on nodes and property on edges. How to store this kind of information in one flat dimensional file, okay? So this is what storage, uh, this is one of the problems storage, database storage needs to solve. And when we design uh, the database storage, we need to take a couple of factors. Uh, first thing is, okay, do we store things that have fixed size and it's always one kilobyte of data? Like we have fixed size records or we have variable size records. And in most cases, we have variable size records. We are not able, in most cases, upfront to say, okay, uh, this, row this uh, node in graph this document will always have no more than one kilobyte it's almost impossible that's one question the other question is when we store data do we want to store it unordered and ordered means you know whatever the order we write this is how this is how we uh, how we store things or we want to store it in particular order 
That's an interesting question because then it means that it will impact how we do sequential versus random uh, reads. And of course, the last question and big battle of you know the end of the 90s, beginning of 2000, do we need schema or we don't need schema? Yeah, this is the SQL versus no SQL what uh, discussion. Do we want uh, do we want allow do we want to allow people to write anything they want or they need to conform to some schema? Uh, and there is the last factor. We need to understand that we need to praise the machine. Okay. What I mean is like whatever design decisions we made, we need to make sure that the hardware will be happy. This is the concept of mechanical sympathy that was like quite popular a couple of years ago. And I still believe it that we as developers can do things that will make hardware go faster. But we cannot rely only on compilers and you know frameworks and we can do things uh simple decisions uh to make hardware happy hardware happy means faster faster means cheaper uh and what i mean by this in databases is the operating system the underlying operating system always reads data and writes data in fixed size pages so probably as you know in, for example in linux you always read four kilobytes and always write four kilobytes uh, blocks. Okay, that's why they are called block devices in Linux. So, if we want to um, be fast and efficient, I think the fixed size uh, is the solution to our, to our problem. Okay, we still can have variable data and variable record sizes, but we can chunk it into fixed size pages, blocks, and to make operating system happy. Uh, use this uh, technique to, to make things faster, okay? So when you design storage, these are the things you need to uh, consider. And then you go into like uh, um, possible solutions of these problems. And I will go through layers and in every layer, I will present one or two concepts and I will just list all the possible uh, uh, solutions, but I will focus on explaining one or two possible implementations. So when we say, okay, uh, we don't care about order uh, uh, of the entries on the disk, we have sequence files, we have heap files, and we have something called ISAM, uh, index sequential access method, okay? So I will, because uh, I'm familiar with heap files, I will explain you, uh, I'm the most familiar with heap files, I will explain you the heap files. So how it works, heap file is uh, split into fixed size blocks, so you have like four kilobytes, 16 kilobytes, whatever you choose, but fixed size blocks. So this is like a collection of, um, you know, of these blocks and every block can contain more, one or more entities. What do I mean by entity? It can be row in the database, it can be document, uh, it can be node on relationship uh, in graph database. So the block can contain multiple things. Uh, and of course, uh, when you add entries, you add it always at the end of the block. When when you run out of space in the block, you allocate a new block on disk, you ask for another block, and you write records, appending records uh, at the end. So as you can see, heap files are really simple. Uh, you try to squeeze as much information data in single block. When there is no enough uh, space, you request new block, and you always write at the end of the file. So you can think about it as an append file. Uh, yeah, so this is what uh, uh, Isan does, the Roberta's question, does the indexing the heap files is reflected in metadata? So basically, uh, the original heap files didn't have indexing, so that's why it, it was, they are super slow, because you always need to do full scan. Uh, and then the Isam is basically the heap file or sequence file with indexes and uh, indexing uh, is in the metadata, okay, it's in separate. Sometimes it's in separate files, sometimes it's in the header of the heap file. It depends on the design of the database, but yeah, exactly true. <clears throat> of course, pros and cons of heap files. They are fairly easy to implement. Uh, writes are fast because you always append at the end of the file. Random access is slow because you need to scan unless you have indexing. 
index of access and space reclamation. When you delete something, what you do in heap file, you just mark thing as deleted and probably never ever use it again. Uh, that's why in databases, you, for example, in PostgreSQL, you have a process called vacuum. When you remove that, I mean that empty, not used uh, blocks or you do compaction uh, of your data. Okay, there are techniques and data structures that doesn't require compaction. Uh, you can use things like free lists and maintain the list of free spaces in the file. Uh, but then keeping the free list consistent with your heap file is you know, another technical challenge. So heap files, they are, as you can expect, not good for large, uh, large databases because you always do uh, sequence, mm, sequence scan. And then you have ordered files. So you have hash files that are basically like hash maps, you have cluster, you have B plus three, and I'm not convinced I should put the log structured merge trees here. Uh, maybe it's a separate category. I need to think about it. But the most uh, popular uh, format of ordered files, ordered storage is of course B plus trees. They like, I think dominated the database uh, space. So, Mm, in many cases, when you create index in database, uh, it doesn't matter if it's you know Mongo or, or SQL, MySQL, the structure of the index will be, be some flavor of B plus three. Because as we can expect, and in, uh, in one one of the books I share at the end, there are in these books there are like six different variations of B plus three with different properties. So this is balanced, uh, self-balanced binary search tree. Uh, it's not necessary, it's not very binary. Ah, I need to fix this slide. Uh, so how it works basically is only leaf nodes of this tree contain the data and everything else intermediate uh, trees contain pointers to another part of, of the tree, okay? And leaf nodes are linked lists. Uh, in most of the presentation uh, implementations and link list of the data. Uh, so they support like random and sequential access uh, as well. What is interesting about B plus three, B plus three is every leaf node is exactly the same distance from the root node. Okay, and the depth of the tree is constant and it's the same for, um, uh, for all the leaf nodes, okay? Uh, and only leaf nodes contains uh, the data. I hope it's uh, it's clear. And every leaf can contain n values. Depends on on properties of of the tree. So as you can see, it can, it can look like this: that you have uh, mm, values. And then on, on the leaves, you have a link list of, uh, you have keys, and then on the leaves, you have list of values as a link list. Let me, uh, yeah, okay. So what is interesting about B plus trees is uh, the time complexity for search, insertion, and deletion is log n. So it's pretty fast. It scales with uh, large uh, databases. What is super interesting is because of its nature, because uh, you know B plus three is kind of binary tree. So you know on the left you have values less than the key, on the right you have values greater than the key. So uh, you get you can use B plus trees to do query optimizations like sorting data because you have data sorted in B plus trees, or you can do easily do range queries uh, using B plus trees. The cons. Uh, the problem is that it takes more space than heap files because you have a lot of pointer chasing and you know additional um, data uh, that you need to store pointers to another nodes. So it takes uh, takes uh, space. That's the one thing. And another thing is, uh, yeah, for write heavy workloads when you have a lot of deletes. And, and inserts, uh, they can become inefficient. So there is like uh, the B plus trees are often in work, uh, right heavy workloads are replaced with log structure matrix. For example, in Cassandra, 
Cassandra, you don't have B plus trees, you have log structure match trees um, as a main structure because you know they uh, promote writing over reading. Uh, so why not always use B, B plus three if it's uh, uh, okay, let me finish the slide and I will uh, answer Robert the question. Uh, so why not always use B plus three? Because if you have a data that is bigger than your single block, and remember, because we communicate with the operating system using blocks, so when you design B plus three, you will also have blocks. So every every node in the B plus three will be the size of the block of the, uh, you will um, write and read from the storage. So it will make the linked list really large and then when you have something that occupies more than one block then you have to merge all these blocks into information and then read the information from it so it's complex yeah they are good uh, with storing small information so that's why they are used to store indexing indexes and pointers to the information that are in the heap files that's why we have like we use in most cases heap like files to store the data and B plus three indexes or hash indexes to store indexes. Uh, so we can have both. Uh, there's a question from Roberto. I know this is out of scope, but are B3 recommended for distributed databases? Yes, of course. Uh, but yeah. So once we have uh, this lovely problem of storing data, our tables, documents solved, and we have everything persistent on disk, we need to come to the next layer of the database architecture. It's called block manager. Sometimes it's called block manager. Sometimes it's called page cache. It's kind of confusing because page cache is a concept from operating systems. It does almost the same thing as block manager. Uh, so, for example, in Neo4j, we call it page cache. Uh, I think in Oracle, it's called block manager, and in PostgreSQL, it's called block manager, but it does the same. It serves the same purpose. And as page cache, um, yeah, we'll come back to it. So, this is how database uh, systems solve this problem. Okay, I have more data than available RAM. So, what I can do? Uh, I can load, all, load only data I need, okay? So what Block Manager does is you don't have all the data in memory and Block Manager loads data on demand when it's needed. So when you issue the query and the data you, you, uh, you need for the query uh, is not in memory, the Block Manager will load it and will keep it more in, uh, in memory. And if there is not enough memory, it will unload and use, uh, it's it's basically a cache, okay? Uh, it will unload and use uh, blocks uh, to make space for uh, the data that's needed. So this is the this is the moment when Pat Helland said the database is cache over the event block, okay? So block manager is basically a cache, really complex cache, but it's a cache, okay? Uh, there is one interesting thing because you don't have only read queries, but you also have write queries in your database. And what happens when you want to write something to a database? Uh, exactly the same uh, thing that happens in operating system. You write this, your changes, your updated record to, uh, to memory, to a block manager, and mark this thing, this block page, you can, I will use block and page, and I will always mean the same, and mark it dirty, okay? And then the data block manager, whenever it will need more space or will commit transaction, it will say, okay, this page is dirty because you executed the write on this page, so then I will flush it, okay? I will flush it to the disk uh, uh, and, and make sure that your changes are persistent. So... Uh, the storing of dirty pages can happen for many reasons, committing transaction, uh, or there is not enough memory you need to reclaim. So you, if page is dirty, you need to first flush it to disk and then uh, reclaim memory, okay? 
Uh, we'll come back to block manager uh, to explain one more concept, of course, uh, in a moment. But uh, as with caches, you need to have some kind of uh, eviction algorithms. And there is like a lot of things like least recently used, least frequently used, low interference recency set, modified LFU, clock pro, which is used in Linux and some of the databases. So you need to have a way to decide uh, which pages need to go away from the main memory. And of course, the good uh, eviction algorithm will make sure that you have a good hit ratio. So you don't distribute, you don't remove pages you, you will need in next few seconds, okay? So this is uh, the whole problem of eviction to not unload data that will be needed. Uh, <clears throat> So as you can see, all the databases work fast if everything fits into the memory. When things start to not fit into the memory, things get slower. So this is, so we have storage. On the storage, we have a uh, block manager, and then we have locking, okay? So this is another comp important component because what happens Remember, internet, concurrent users, many customers are hitting your website and you have multiple threads trying to write the information to the same block. And what is interesting is in the same block, you can have multiple records, okay? So even if you have uh, like different users and you need to load the right different data for different users, this different users uh, can be in the same block physically in the same block of storage, and then it means in the same block in the memory. So you need to protect access to the same block to a single thread. Yeah, you need to have mutual exclusion to make sure that only one uh, thread will modify this block. How it's done? So uh, databases uh, use technique called locking protocols, because as you can see uh, and expect, there's a lot of concurrency happening. And it's you know super easy to get into deadlocks and other weird uh, stuff. So um, databases employ something called locking protocols. And there are different kinds of locking pro protocols. Some are locked based. Some they are based on timestamp, and then they are used to implement like optimistic locking. And then there are things based on the uh, validation based concurrency protocols. Uh, what I will explain and show is, of course, the simplest one, the locking-based concurrency protocol. So it's like, of, and every of its protocols has its variations. So it has different uh, properties, and depending on what kind of isolation level uh, you want to have in your database and what kind of properties, is like, is it... Uh, write heavy database, is it all up or OLTP database, you will probably choose different locking protocols. And the simplest locking protocols looks like this, that you know, whenever you access the page, uh, you first need to lock this page and then uh, before every uh, insert delete operation, update operation, you need to get, um, get the log to this page, and then when you complete the transaction, you when you finish the query, then you release all the logs. That's the simplest possible. But uh, what is more complex, but it's also more interesting and more performant is two-phase locking, where basically uh, you have two kinds of logs, shared logs, so also called read logs. So, you know, uh, you can have multiple threads reading the same stuff at the same time. And then you have write logs when you can have only one thread, that's why it's called uh, exclusive, only one thread that does the modification, yeah, does the write. So if all the transactions are only reading, everybody is happy, everybody can come in, in, come in read the data, everybody is fine. But if one of the transaction, transactions wants to write to the same page, all other uh, uh, transactions need to wait, okay? And even if you start write uh, operation and there is reading progress, you meet, need to wait until all the read, reads are done, all the read, read logs are released, and then you can do the write. So that's one, one property of two-phase locking protocols. Another is uh, in its name. So locking is split into two phases, the expanding phase and shrinking phase. So in expanding phase, this is the only phase when you can 
acquire a lock and you cannot release. So it looks like in the beginning of the transaction, you acquire all the locks you, are, you have needed. And then at the end of the transaction, you release all the locks that you need. So there is no releasing and acquiring in the middle. You know, if you do everything in the beginning and after expanding phase, the only thing you can do is release, you cannot acquire new locks. Okay. So that's the two, uh, two phase locking protocol. And if you are careful, careful listening to SA, it's in your head should be okay, but what about row level locking? Yeah, the databases, the SQL databases have row level locking. You can have table level locking where it happens. So, because what we are talking here is the block manager level locking. We are protecting the pages. We are protecting, we're protecting block, protecting blocks. We are not protecting single records. We are not protecting tables. So what mm, databases do, they use like kind of hierarchy of locks. So we have locking protocols at the level of the block manager, and they are often called latches to differentiate them from row level, table level locks. Okay, and the row level table level level logs are implemented higher in the stack, and they protected entities or tables. Uh, but you need to make sure that you also have a protection on on the page level. Okay, so you have two levels of concurrency: latches that protect pages, blocks, and then you have logs that protect uh, tables and and uh, rows. Okay. Uh, yeah, this is so okay. Uh, <clears throat> so much content, uh, content. So what is interesting is uh, if you log row, it means that you also need to log the page in this, in which this uh, row is uh, written. Okay. A uh, question from Roberto. If I get the browser, yeah, it's like writing branches and protecting leaves. Yes. Yes. So the question from Roberto is, uh, was that, uh, if I get it this right, it's like protecting branches and protecting leaves. Exactly. Uh, so the leaves are pages, and and then you need to protect your your branches. Sure. A great question. <clears throat> and then when you write, okay, how to how you ensure that you know you write something, and then uh, you want to. In your transaction, you want to read what you've written, but you don't want to make it visible for others. So uh, a lot of databases, uh, I didn't do like uh, serious research how many databases employ this technique, but they do something called shadow pages. And I think shadow pages for me, the better name is copy on write. So even in Java, you have, if you are programming in Java, you know you have copy on write list. So basically, when you write, before you start to write to a block, you create a copy of this block, write all the information to this copy. So then when you do like reads in this transaction and you want to read your own writes, you read from the copy. And then you up, when you commit transaction, you apply changes from the copy to your block manager and to the storage. Okay, so this is... Uh, Often combined with uh, with locking, mm, but you also take a copy of uh, when you write something. So now we have like storage, uh, locking, and then we go to the transaction lock. Okay, why we need standard transaction lock if we have a persistent storage? You know, we have D plus trees, you have we have heap files, and so on and so on. So the problem is, remember what I said: you mark the page as dirty. Okay, you don't write it immediately. You just mark it as dead, dirty. Why? Because you need speed. Okay, you don't want to write every single page every time, because maybe the next transaction will come and this also will modify this page. So there can be situation that you have a lot of dirty pages, and then comes the crash. You know, the server breaks, the segfault, whatever uh, explosion, code strike. You name it, somebody accidentally kills the process, things can happen. So then we need transaction lock uh, to ensure that if we have some unwritten information in our block manager, we don't lose it when you know the disaster happens. 
why we don't commit things, why we don't write things on every commit. Yeah? So in your head, it should be like, okay, maybe we do commit and on every commit, we take all the pages we modified during this commit and we flush it. Pick, okay? So because, you know, imagine you write to, you will need to write to B, B plus trees. They have complexity. They, it's not as simple as writing to heap. So writing, updating storage, like, you know, heap files, and imagine you have a database and you have a table with four indexes. Four is enough, 30 indexes. Let's go crazy. We have a table with 14, 30 indexes, and you need to update 30 indexes when you finish the transaction. So it's pretty heavy IO operation. So that's why you keep things dirty in, in the manager, in the block manager, uh, and you write it uh, when you need it. So first thing, you don't always flush things because the file system is slow. Another thing is atomicity. Yeah. So atomicity is something that is guaranteed by the locking protocol and also the storage that you know you don't have atomic operations on multiple files or multiple pages on operating system hardware doesn't support it so how to implement atomic changes pretend you did atomic changes when the operating system and the hardware doesn't pro provide such guarantees and of course durability that's super interesting you go to the operating system and you write the ask operating system please write this data it doesn't mean it does it because the operating system has page cache. Okay. So you have block manager. Then you ask, write me this data. It goes to page cache and page cache plays the same role as block manager in databases. So when you, when operating system returns from write operation, it doesn't mean the data is on disk. Okay. It's in the package cache, but it's not in disk. So, if you think about it, the first ever databases are our file systems. That's why they are called directories, folders, and files. It's the same words people use in libraries because the databases and operating systems are actually databases. File system and page cache is a database. Very special database, but it's a database. <laughs> of course, you can call fsync every time. This is a special system call and force files, page cache to be synced with storage, but it's expensive. So what you do, you have the concept of transaction log. And actually there are two ways to do it. One is called journal file. And in case of journal file, what you do is before committing the transaction, you take the original page. So you have the shadow page, you have a copy of your original page. So you write down the original page on disk to a journal file and then you apply the change. So if something happens with journal file, you can redo and do your operation, okay? So if something was written to journal, it's written to journal, but it was not persistent, it will be undone and, and will mm, revert uncommitted transactions. If the transaction was, wasn't marked as uh, committed. So that's one thing is journal files. Another thing, quite important and like, you know, for example, PostgreSQL uh, implements this thing is write a head log, okay? Uh, so what we do is before every operation, we write down all the changes we did in a transaction, okay? And transaction is only committed if we flushed all the information to transaction log. So you may say, okay, Flushing to transaction log is okay, but flushing to uh, storage is not okay. It's, it is okay because the write ahead log is up and only file. You don't do anything, anything fancy. Write ahead log behaves like Kafka partition, Kafka topic. You append at the end, it's really fast. You don't do any modifications. You don't replace any pages. You just write sequence of operations you did up into a file, it's faster. You don't modify, uh, you know, indexes and so on and so on and so on. You just write your changes, you know, the state before and after modification. So the transaction is only committed when the transaction log 
says, okay, I synced. I not only written my data, but I also synced my data to this, okay? And then, you know, whatever you have uh, dirty left in block storage. So the, the, the basic architecture of the transaction log is, you know, first you um, write a record called begin, and the begin record will have the transaction ID, timestamp, and a few interesting things. And then you write at the end, you write all the operations of, or the update, it deletes up, uh, inserts to a transaction log, and then you write a special record called commit, and then it means, okay, committed. So all the changes with the same transaction ID between begin and commit, are persisted, at least in the transaction log. They are in block manager, but probably not yet flushed, okay? So it's all about deferring the moment when you flush things uh, from the disk to memory. And usually, uh, in most cases, every entry uh, in the transaction looks like this, but you have transaction ID, the object ID, so probably, you know, document ID in Mongo, and for example, row ID uh, in, uh, relational databases or node ID in graphs, and then you have state of the object before and after the change, okay? So this is in the transaction log. So then when, after crash you start, you see all committed and uncommitted logs, and you can apply these changes from transaction log to your storage files. Okay. So two more layers. I think you are you're, you're still with me. I see 23 people, so that's good. So, uh, we have storage, we have locking, we have block manager, we have locking, uh, we have uh, transaction lock, and there is like the thing you work the most, the query engine. Huh? So you are sending things, your SQL, whatever language you use to talk with the database, in most cases it's SQL. If you work with Neo4j, Cypher, uh, you send your queries. So how the queries are processed. Basically, you get the query, the query is parsed, it's validated, but this is no the current syntax, uh, it's semantic, uh, semantic information is, is correct, you know, you have these tables, uh, you have this uh, fields in these tables, and so on and so on. Uh, the query is transformed into the query plan, and then the query plan is sent to... <laughs> Yeah, uh, from Yaroslav, uh, RNA is like ISAM and DNA is like transactional tables. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I love it. Uh, I will probably steal it uh, <laughs> for my next presentation. So, uh, and query engine takes the query plan and uh, executes it. Let's take a, and there will be some code. I will use Java, but like really basic Java. Uh, for reference, uh, just to explain how it works, because I think I will spend like more next two hours waiting my hands trying to, ex to explain it, and and code will speak for itself. So let's take for example this query: select name from uh, users where user you know age equal uh, greater than eighteen, you know sort by age and limit one. So what is query plan? So query, how the database work, they change query into series, actually a tree of operators. And every operator does one specific thing. Does one thing and one thing only and does it good. So this query probably in some you know, not existing database will say, okay, I do sequence scan. So I will go through all the users in, uh, in the table. Then um, I will apply filter. So, you know, uh, find only users with age over 18, then I will sort, I will limit, and then do project projection. So usually projection is, uh, if you have like a read-only query, projection is the root of your query plan, you know? So projection says, okay, how, what I want to actually see. I don't want to see a whole table. I only care about specific field from the state. <clears throat> so the query plan is a tree of operators. And operators are function, uh, function like pieces of code, but take something uh, like tuples. It can be documents, it can be rows, it can be nodes, uh, and emit returns tuples. That's this is like really basic function. It takes object and returns object. That's the uh, the whole 
fancy thing about a uh, fancy thing about query mm, mm, query engines. And of course, you have different query processing models. So you have different ways of execute this uh, of executing interpreting actually this tree. Okay, of uh, operators. So there are things called query processing models, and they uh, basically say how you change operators, how you execute this tree. Uh, and of course, different query processing models can work better for different scenarios. Basically, we have three ways of uh, three basic approaches. One is called operator model. Sometimes you will see in uh, literature books that it's called volcano model. Uh, then you have materializa materialization model. Is MapReduce a yes? And Roberto asked question if MapReduce is a type of query model. Yes. Uh, MapReduce is a type of uh, uh, type of query processing model. That's true. Uh, so you have iterator model, materialization model, and you know the uh, the latest invention and really people praises and lots of things are moving to this direction is vectorized slash batch uh, batch model. And I will explain only one the fact uh, the iterator model. Okay, how it works. <clears throat> Show me the code. So. <clears throat> How I would implement the volcano model in Java. So basically, I need something that serves like gen as a generic operator interface. So you have this lifecycle that uh, you open the operator, you call next in a loop, okay? And every time you call next, you receive the next tuple. The tuple can be, you can insert here whatever you want. It, it can be row, it can be document, it can be node in a graph. Whatever your operating model, uh, your model of the databases. And then you close the operator. So you say, okay, I'm finished processing. Uh, I'm done processing. So for example, let's say that we have in-memory database and this in-memory database uh, has, you know, a set of cursors, I mean, sorry, set of tuples. So uh, how would the scan, sequential scan look like? Like this, okay? Every time I call next, I return the next entry in a database. That's sequential scan, the simplest possible operator. Every time I call next, uh, uh, I get the next row, sequential scan. Okay, so how would the filter look like? Filter will say, okay, we have a predicate. So the predicate is our age greater than 18. And I call, so as you can see, these operators are in three. So the tuple, um, the selection operator is child of the scan operator. And I mean, the opposite, sorry. The scan operator is a child of selection operator. So it means we first call selection operator. Selection operator goes to the child, calls next. So it receives the next tuple. And then we do filtering. Yeah, we call the predicate and see if our tuple passes the test. If yes, we return it. If no, we continue iterating over the things. If we are, once we are done iterating the child operator, we can say, okay, we are done operating, um, iterating this operator. That's why it's called iterator model. And then another example is projection when the selection operator is a child of projection operator, and the projection, what it does, it selects only the columns that we are interested in. So as you see, I go to the, my selection operator, selection operator will go to scan operator. I will get the value probably, and then I will extract from the value the columns I'm interested in, and I will return back, okay? So that's how operators look. If I, if you, if, if, if you think about it, this is how you can do joins. It's really flexible model. You know, sorting, uh, aggregation, all this kind of fancy things can be described in this life cycle. So at the end, how it looks like, if we have this simple database like this in memory database, and we have scan operator, and then the selection, which have scan as a child, and then projection, which has selection as a child, when I take the projection and I start to call next on projection, it will delegate all to the next uh, child operators and 
the query is done. Okay, it's not that simple, but um, at least you get the concept. Yeah, the iterator model is pretty uh, common, and of course, but there are new, better things, ways to do it. But still, databases uh, in most, of, well, in a lot of cases, use uh, the bulk gain model. Okay, we are coming to an end uh, because this is the last part of the architecture of the databases I wanted to talk about. So you have we have storage. On the storage, we have the block manager. On the block manager, we have a locking protocols. And then we have transaction log. On the top of the transaction log, uh, we have query execution. And then we have query planner. Why we need plan planner? What actually planner does? So as you can imagine, if you send a query, there can be multiple ways to get to the same results, OK? Uh, in simple queries, it's really hard to think about it. Uh, but in really complex queries, you can execute operators in different orders, which will still give you the same response, but will be faster. Okay, So the query planner is something that modifies your query plan before it sends this query plan to query plan is like a compiler. Yes. Uh, there was a comment from you as well, but query planner is like a compiler. It is optimizing compiler. And it's what is interesting. What is interesting, uh, query planner generates multiple query plans and only one, the best one is selected. So I will talk briefly uh, about it. So, you know, you can do joins in, in many ways. You can, for example, uh, oh, I have it on the next slide. Is this query plan optimal? Yeah. So we have sequence scan, filter, sort, limit, and so on. What query planner is doing is, OK, I have this plan. It looks OK. But I know, so this is the information that query planner has. Query planner has, I know I have index on H. OK, somebody created index on this field. So I can rewrite this plan into this plan. So I can use property of B plus trees and say, OK, rather than doing you know, all database sequence scan, and all we know that when we see sequence scan, your, our database is dead and performance is dead. Yeah? So I can change my sequence scan into range seek uh, or range index scan and change this query, this query into this query. Yeah? Still, I get the same data, uh, but it's faster. So. The first implementation is really interesting. The first implementation of the query planner was in the IBM system R database in 70s. And uh, I read about it uh, somewhere that actually people thought that this is the wrong approach and the computers will never be able to generate plans better than humans can generate. What a surprise. Uh, uh, we have mm, really good planners. Sometimes query planner can make bad decisions, and uh, I will show you why. Um, so basically, how how query planner does the optimizations, and this is the source of bad decisions. Uh, so this is coming from Ramis. But yeah, planner can sometimes like fuck up things. Basically, there are two ways. One is rule based planners, and the other ones are cost based planners. And in the rule-based planners, it's like really, if the query looks like this, generate this plan. So this is human written by human written set of rules. But if you have sort and after sort, you have filtering, maybe you have not do sort first and then you do filtering, depending on the situation. So this is like rule-based planners. And of course, as you can see, people can make bad rules. The database designer, designers, uh, developers can write wrong rules. So this is one possible source of wrong planner decisions. Another approach, and sometimes we have like these things used at the same time, the rules and cost, is cost-based approach. So what happens is the database selects, the planner selects the less costly plan. What is the plan cost? So the plan cost is the number. <laughs> Sergey wrote what we definitely have to AI to query planner. That's not funny. 
Uh, CRG, because there is a concept called um, machine learning indexes, where the databases will use machine learning to create indexes. And from machine learning to AI, this is like quite close. So I expect that we will see uh, not maybe AI driven, but machine learning driven uh, indexes and planners. Uh, what is query cost? The query cost is the cost of file system access. So how many times we had to go to disk? This is the higher, the more you refer to disk, the higher the cost of the query. Then you need to have yeah, like how much memory you need for to execute the query, because maybe you have sort that needs extra memory. You Maybe you have another aggregation functions. Aggregations are really bad. If you look into database papers and books, aggregations are a nightmare, basically. And of course, network cost and CPU. So what happens is we execute query and we calculate the cost of the query by calculating the cost of each operator. And then we say, okay, this is the, the lost costly query. Uh, it's the cheapest query, so I will choose this one. So this is where the database can get wrong because the database need to collect statistics. And it will collect, you know, okay, I, I had this plan, and I executed this plan, and for this plan, I had this cost. But, you know, not all the day, the same plan for different data will generate different number of uh, database hits, okay? Maybe you have an uh, order that has only one line, or maybe you have a customer order that has 1,000 lines. So they will have different query costs. That's why uh, databases, when have, they have screwed up statistics, or you have really large distribution of data in your system, like you have objects that have like one entries and objects that have like hundreds of entries, the query planner will make bad decisions, of course, because statistics is the highest, what we say in Poland, is the highest form of lying. Uh, so if statistics lie, the query planner will lie. So what happens is the planner takes the query yeah, maybe a uh, great comment from Roberto again. Uh, maybe you think AI could reduce the cost of cost-based query. Yeah, yeah, I think so. That's interesting concept. So what happens in Planner, the Planner takes your SQL string or whatever you have, uh, changes it into AST, the abstract syntax, syntax tree, and generates like logical plan. So this is how the things could look like. Then does the number of optimizations of this logical plan then it changes logical plan into something called physical plan. And physical plan is actually what will happen during the query execution. And the physical plan is passed to the query engine, okay? So, and there are different optimizations that happen on the level of, as you can see, the query planner has logical plan and I think N logical plans because it's like number of rewrites uh, of the same logical plan. And then you have, uh, physical plan that is executed. So for example, logical plans uh, can say like, say I will do filtering earlier or later in the query, okay? Because maybe it's better to do filtering in the beginning so you will have less data to sort, for example, yeah? Or less data to join. So maybe it's better to push, if it's possible, of course, uh, to push the filtering uh, in the early stage. Reordering predicates. Maybe I should uh, reorder by uh, reorder by age first, filter by age, and then filter by name, because I have different cardinality. Yeah. Good, good comments, guys. Really good comments. Uh, you, you can split uh, um, predicates that are together and execute them in different, in, in different parts. You can do projections earlier. So, because if you do projection, you, it means you don't really, you don't have to pass the whole document. You will pass only the field fields that are needed in this document in, in row. So maybe sometimes projection is not the end. It will be at the end in the logical plan, the first version of the logical plan. But then after optimization, it can be in the middle because who knows? Yeah? Uh, the same with joins, you know, the order of joins. Uh, so this is what kind of optim uh, optimizations the logical plan does. And then we have physical plan where the physical plan says, okay, I have sequence scan here from the logical plan, but I see that I have index. Okay, I will replace index scan, uh, sequence scan with index scan. 
Yeah, I would choose different like hash joins or other joins. Uh, I will choose jo different join operator depending on if I have indexes or maybe I don't have indexes and so on. I will select different sorting implementation because if I sort something that will squeeze into RAM, I can use the regular sort. If I have to sort like the whole database, I will need to use merge sort, but means I will select heavier al algorithm because I will need to sort something that doesn't screen into RAM. And of course, you can lose, uh, use something like index back, back projections. Like in some cases, I think it, uh, I saw it first in Mongo, is if all of your data you need to execute query are in index, the tables, the collections are not touched. You only talk with index. So this is what physical plan can do and say, okay, I have complex compound index and I have like age, name and something in the index. And this is all the data I operate in this query. So I don't need to go to my block manager and fetch this table to the memory because our the data I need are in indexes. It can decide that, okay, I have an index so I can use indexed for sorting. Yeah. So this is the kind of optimizations the physical plan does. And at the end, of course, cardinality, because, you know, uh, so how many tuples will be emitted by operator? Yeah? You want to have the most limited, the most selective operator in the beginning. So then down the pipeline, you will deal with less data. You filter all the, you know, crap in the beginning uh, uh, of the query execution, and then you sort, uh, aggregate, uh, join less data. Yeah? So cardinality and uh, gathering cardinality statistics is a really important part of the databases. Distributed databases. As you saw, it's over an hour. Yeah, so I skip it. Maybe next time, yeah. Uh, it's the end, actually. Everything else is like, you know, uh, additional things like networking, drivers, and so on, but this is like what I extracted, I think, is the heart of every database uh, you touch uh, in your professional life. And if you want to go deeper and really like understand, because, you know, when I say uh, locking protocols, there are like 18 or something different ways to do it. Uh, when I say uh, B plus trees, there are six or something implementations, different ways and different uh, variations of, of B plus trees. So I just try to introduce con uh, concepts. If you want to go deeper, the first book, and I ordered it in in the level like of uh, from the greatest to like so so. Database concept books uh, book called sometimes the DB book. Uh, uh, it's like exactly this, but 400 pages. Then there is open. Uh, free and available on YouTube uh, course by Andy Pavlo. He is like a uh, really important figure in the databases world. He's teaching databases in, in some uh, uh, university and he's writing a lot of papers and uh, uh, yeah, lots of uh, materials by him. And his course that is uh, um, available for free, it's, it's recording. On YouTube, you can find it. Just write introduction to database system and the Pablo on YouTube, and you'll find it. It's really great. Then there is a book from the guy who um, was uh, working with Cassandra, writing Cassandra, um, uh, called Database Internals. It's good, but I'm not a big fan of it because it focuses only on storage and uh, distributed systems. It keeps the query part, uh, transaction log part, locking and so on. So if you want to read about B plus trees, log um, structure, match trees and so on, the database internals is really good, uh, but it doesn't contain any references to query processing and query planner. Then there is a blog from our former architect, uh, Chris Gioran. He is writing his own. He left Neo4j. He is writing his own database and he's writing open source database and he is writing, you know, his uh, adventures. Uh, uh, he is writing this database in Rust, so uh, quite interesting. And then the database design implementation is a really good book. The last two, I'm not a big fan of it. Oh, I made it. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you very much for all your questions. It was really uh, um, good to see you being active. Uh, uh, so, yeah, I hope you enjoyed it. 
Oh, yeah. If we return to the roots with NoSQL databases, then what will be the next step for transactional DBs? Uh, it's interesting. Uh, there is an uh, uh, interesting thing you, I recommend to research. It's called new SQL. So what happened is we came back to NoSQL databases because we wanted like faster things. We wanted to give up consistency and some of the guarantees because, you know, more data uh, online services. And what happened is, I think we learned a lot building NoSQL databases. And now all the things we learned building new NoSQL databases are applied by transactional DBs. So if you are, read about concept called new SQL, it's basically, OK, NoSQL was great. Uh, we learned a lot. So let's apply the same techniques uh, in transactional DBs. So uh, yeah, another circle starts. So uh, NoSQL was a big experiment. Uh, some databases, NoSQL databases, uh, start to employ transactionality, like Neo4j, graph database, our database is transactional. We have transactions in Mongo. So it looks like there is like a mashup. Uh, perspective future database evolution, as you see it. Oh, uh, I think it's, there are three, I think, areas is one area is usage of machine learning and AI for, you know, this is what was discussed in the chat. So uh, for building indexes, uh, for um, creating plans. So we use uh, ML and AI to do it. Another thing is getting closer and closer to hardware because, you know, the evolution of hardware is really pushed by database needs. So, you know, like vectorized, uh, mm, vectorized processing models that use vector index, uh, vector operations from CPUs. So we will see things that are getting closer and closer to hardware and database that will get closer and closer to hardware. Like there are databases that don't write to file system through operating system, but write through specialized drivers. So they skip page cast, they skip, uh, the operating system and you write directly on on hardware so uh two things uh, ai ml getting closer to hardware and using like advanced hardware uh things no ssds are getting faster and vram is getting faster and the thing uh what will surprise you is sql will be king still in my opinion so and sql will evolve I don't know if you uh, know recently SQL uh, has new version with support for graph databases. Like age, years ago, we added support for JSONs to SQL. So SQL will still become the king, will adopt different model models, will on, not only work with tables, will work with different data structures, but it will be still SQL. We will have better support and better usage of hardware because hardware advances, maybe we'll see databases running on, you know, uh, NVIDIA, <laughs> uh, GPUs, probably, maybe, you know, you can use vectorized operations uh, and GPUs are really good at it. Uh, and of course, you know, ML and AI, these are the things I will, I think will happen in, in, uh, in these uh, databases. Okay, one more question, blockchain. Uh, I don't have an opinion. It's uh, no no opinion. I never did anything in blockchain, so uh, yeah, I would say I don't know. It's uh, it's hard for me to say. Yeah, blockchain is like transaction log. Yeah, that's true. It's close to this concept, but it means that you every time you need to like fold it and. Then the question is, can we, with blockchain, can we have some, like, you know, snapshotting caches to make it faster? But uh, I'm too far away from this topic. 